Okay, uh, very good evening to everyone. I'm Simon from Philip Futures. Thank you everyone from, for joining this uh, webinar today. Um, I'll be sharing about Spot Forex, Boolean and CFD trading today. Um, okay, I'm not sure how many of you have uh, started trading in uh, CFD or Spot Forex or Boolean. So if you have not been trading uh, these products before, right, then this is the right webinar to attend. But even if let's say you have uh, uh, traded before and you know the basics, well, I will hope you can stay to the end because uh, at the end of the session, right, I'll be sharing some ways to use uh, CFD contracts to do some uh, strategies. Okay, so um, let me go to the uh, highlights for today. So, okay, for today, this will what uh, this is what I will be going through. So, first of all, of course, just a basic understanding of what CFD is, and I will touch about a few different uh, products. A category that are more popular uh, and why are people trading it and I'll touch a little bit on margin trading just a short one to introduce what margin trading is about so you may have heard of margin trading or leverage trading so this is where I will share uh, what is it about and the fourth part will of course uh, be talking about some a little bit about the fundamental analysis so like what factors are affecting the prices and last but not least I will share what are the some of the upcoming events that we have uh, prepared for you and some of the webinars too. Okay, all right, so uh, for a start, let's uh, begin. So uh, what is CFD? We heard of this term, CFD in short, but what exactly is it? Um, CFD is actually derived from for, from this term called contract for differences, for difference. Okay, what exactly does it mean? It's actually just an agreement between two parties to settle between the buying and selling price. So um, in layman's term, you're actually trading off the price. You're just having an agreement, say, okay, I'm buying at, uh, this price from you, selling this price from you, but, uh, but there's no physical delivery involved, All right? There's no physical delivery. So for example, if we are talking about gold, we look at the price on screen, it's 1,009 now. So you say, okay, I'd like to buy 1,009. And then the other party will say, okay, I can sell to you. So there's an agreement uh, to buy and sell at 1009. And then the price goes up, okay, say I want to sell back, okay. And then you make a profit. So that's all. So it's contract for difference in the price. There's no physical delivery involved. So that's as, uh, what actually CFD means. So it's a trade between the client and the brokerage house. All right. Um, CFD started in UK in London uh, in about 1990s. And uh, this, this it was first created because the investor want to gain exposure to many asset classes without having to physically own them, which I mentioned just now. So this, this is how the CFD began. And it started to gain popularity because we don't have to come up with the full uh, asset value. So for example, gold per ounce is about 1,008 right now. Uh, if you trade CFD, you don't have to come up with 1,008 to buy an ounce of gold. You only probably need to uh, give a small deposit. So say maybe a few hundred dollars, you can uh, trade uh, the full size gold contract. Okay, because there's no physically uh, physical delivery involved, so there's no need to pay in full. So the the counterparty only requires a margin of deposit. That's why it's very popular because it's, you can start with a small capital, right? And there's also no expiry date. Okay, so it makes it easy for investor to hold position without, without thinking of whether, oh, when is this contract gonna expire or do I need to roll over and things like that. Okay, so this is uh, how the CFD started. And, <clears throat> excuse me. So you can see that um, there are many products under CFDs. Okay, you can see uh, they have Forex, we have Boolean, the commodities, indices, shares, and even cryptocurrencies right now are, are very popular. So for today, uh, I will touch on mainly Forex, Boolean, as well as the index, okay, indices trading. So these are the more popular uh, contracts that are traded in CFDs, right? So we'll go through in more details on this, this few contracts. So for a start, let's talk about Forex trading first. Um, what is Forex trading? Uh, I believe actually many of us have done Forex trading before. 
Okay, it simply means uh, exchange of currency. So we, if we go to money changer, right, and we do some exchange of currency, that is also part of Forex trading. Okay, of course, when we trade, the amount is small, um, and the, 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 the transaction is not a lot. Okay, we, we just do uh, sometimes once in a while when we go overseas, then we do this forex trading. But when it comes to real forex trading, uh, um, people trading for profits, right? Of course, there's a difference between we go to money changer and trading for profits. So what are the main differences? So first of all, in forex trading, um, the minimum, or I would just say the standard contract size is 100,000 or in a, a professional term we call one leg okay so 100,000 is the, is the is the standard contract size for exchanging right and if you go money changer maybe you exchange one thousand two thousand dollars okay but in forex trading minimum size is hundred thousand okay and but we don't have to come up with the full hundred thousand like i mentioned um in forex trading we only need to come up with a deposit or what we call a margin of the full contract value. So in Singapore, the maximum allowed leverage is 5%. So meaning instead of coming up with 100,000, you only need to come up with 5,000 and you can trade up to a 100,000 size worth of contract. Okay, so this is what we call margin trading. There'll be more details later on on margin trading. And of course, you, you may think that, oh, $5,000 is still a lot for me. Yeah. Uh, right now, um, standard contract size is 100,000, but of course, in our platform, we are able to um, do 10,000 or even down to $1,000 size. Okay, so that is uh, $50 margin for $1,000 size. Okay, we'll come to that later on as well. And in uh, CFD forex trading, right, there's no physical transaction of the cash. So, uh, like I mentioned, in uh, the difference between money changing is we, we do receive the fiscal cash, but in forex trading, we don't have to handle the fiscal cash. All transactions are done online. Okay, so these are the main differences. And in forex trading, uh, you can see that all the currencies uh, have a standard symbol. Right? It's a three letter code. So you can see for uh, US dollar is USD and British pound, Swiss franc, uh, so on. So you can see they have a standard code to represent them. This is an international standard. And they are also always quoted in pairs. That means if you want to buy the USD, you have to, you have to sell another currency. Okay, it, because it's always in the exchange. So there must be a counter currency. So example, you can see that this pair is a US versus a Japanese yen. There's a Euro versus the USD and the pound versus USD. So it's always quoted in a pair. So how do we read this pair? How do we uh, interpret, uh, what, what does this mean? Okay, um, so you can see that there's a uh, first one and the second one. The first one is always, is called the base currency. Okay, so for example, this, this case here, the Euro against the US, the first one is the Euro, we call it the base currency. So when we say buy or sell, we are referring to the base currency, okay, Euro. When I say I want to buy this pair, Euro USD, I'm referring to Euro. When I say I want to sell, I'm also referring to Euro. So it's it's not confusing. Okay, this is international standard also. So when we say buy or sell, we always refer to the first one only. So there's no confusion, right? And the opposite, the USD is called the counter currency. This is where the profit and loss, uh, this is the profit and loss currency, okay, which we will see later on. Okay, so right now, if let's say I add in an exchange rate. So uh, on screen, maybe I see Euro USD. The rate now is 1.2850. What does that mean? Okay, it simply means that one Euro can be exchanged for 1.285 USD. Okay, so the first one, the base currency is always a one. Okay, the base currency is always a one. And then the rate means what is the counter currency that you can exchange for, all right? This currency is always one, and the counter currency is where the profit and loss will be settled. So if I trade the Euro USD pair, my profit and loss will be in US dollars. Okay, so this is what it means. Okay, and then now we come to interpreting the um, 
uh, what you call that? How how do we calculate the points, right? Um, base currency, counter currency, okay. So in uh, forex trading, the minimum movement is called a pip, percentage in points, and it's the fourth decimal place. It's the fourth decimal place percentage in point. Um, this is traditionally the standard, but right now because of technology advancement, right? Um, we are able to code even smaller than the pip, right? So that's why there's this called the fractional pips, which is the fifth decimal point. Okay, fifth decimal point. But traditionally, people has been used to the fourth decimal place. So when we say how many pips, usually we refer to the fourth decimal place, right? So this is what we need to take note. So one small movement in forex is one pip, and it's the fourth decimal place. Okay. So a quick summary, forex trading, um, some of the things that we need to know. Forex is always coded in the past, and um, the coded currency in front is the base currency. So when we say buy or sell, it refers to the base currency. Also, when we look at the chart right, of a currency pair, up or down refers to the first currency. Okay? And the second currency is the counter currency, and this is where the profit and loss is settled in this currency. And one small movement in the currency is called a pip. It's a percentage in point, and it's the fourth decimal place, 0 0.001. Except for Japanese yen pair, because Japanese is a very large currency. So um, one pip in Japanese yen is actually 0 0.01, okay, the second decimal place. All other currency pairs, except Japanese yen, is fourth, four decimal place, and Japanese yen is two decimal place. Okay, two thermal spaces. So uh, this is what we roughly need to know. Okay, based on all this that I've shared right now, let's take a look at this question. Okay, so let's say we want to trade um, Aussie against the sink. Right, we think that, okay, based on this question, we say, okay, I want to buy. I want to buy 100,000 worth of Aussie sink. And the rate quoted to us is 1.08. Okay, and it was done, trade was put through. Two days later, this Aussie thing appreciated and the rate now is 1.09. So in this case, how much profit and loss um, have I made? Okay, just take a few seconds and, and uh, think about it. Okay, because in this question here, right, um, we need to understand what we have uh, learned just now, or what we have heard just now, so that we will be able to understand this question and we'll be able to calculate the profit and loss. So to solve this question, right, first thing to ask is when we say buy, are we buying Aussie or buying Sing? So based on my sharing just now, when we say buy, it's always the first one, so it's Aussie, right? So I'm buying Australian dollars, 100,000. And two days later, Australian dollar appreciated, Aussie Sing appreciated, exchange rate now is 1.09. So I made a profit of 0 0.01, okay, 0 0.01 per dollar. And how much is how much did I buy? I buy 100,000. So I need to take 0 0.01 multiply by 100,000. So that'll be my notional profit, my, my profit. But in what currency? Okay, my profit is in what currency? Australian or is it in Sing? Okay. So the answer is the third one, right? Profit of $1,000 sing. Okay. So um, this is how we calculate the profit and loss also in forex trading. All right. So um, next we'll go on to the types of orders. Um, to do online trading, we need to understand different kinds of order types so that we can execute our trade correctly. So first batch of orders, or I would say uh, things that we need to know is the expiry type. Okay. Um, so when I put up an order, I want to tell the system whether I want this order to be um, good to cancel. Good to cancel means there's no expiry to this order type, to this order. All right. So uh, if it's not done today, if I queue a price and the price isn't reached, it will continue to queue on and on until it's done or I cancel it. That's why it's called good till cancel. Or we can choose a day order. 
Okay, day order means uh, 24 hours. Okay, uh, not 24 hours, sorry. It's 5 a.m. cutoff time. Okay, every day 5 a.m. 5 a.m. if the trade is not done, you'll be cancelled. So you're going into place again. All right. There's another order type that you can actually specify which date you want the order to be until and until what time as well. Okay, so this uh, usually we will recommend you to use this specific date because uh, if you put GTC, sometimes after a while we forgot that we have this order and maybe one year later the order is done. Okay, it's possible, it happened before. So we usually recommend um, traders to use a day order or a specific, at least you specify a time, a period. Okay, so it's actually, uh, actually safer. Okay, so the basic order types we need to know also is um, there are three types. Market order. Market order simply means you buy and sell, buy or sell at current market price. Okay, so straight away once you click market order, it will be done at whatever the price quoted on screen. Okay, limit order is for us to queue to set a buying or selling price, and we queue at a certain price to to wait for the market to reach there. So if let's say I want to queue to buy lower, okay, I will use limit order. Okay, queue to buy lower, and then I will set a price lower than the market price. So once the market reached there, it will automatically execute a buy for me. Same for selling. Okay, I can queue at a higher price to sell. And stop order. Stop order usually is used for uh, limiting losses or cut loss. Okay. So for example, after I buy, and um, but if the price continues to drop up to a certain level, I want to cut my losses. Okay, you can use the stop order to put there. Because Forex is a 24 hours market. So um, sometimes during uh, night time, if you're sleeping and you're not watching, right, it's better to put a stop order in case there's some sudden news or unexpected uh, events that cause the market to move. And then if you don't have a stop order, um, the position may run very well. So it's better to put some limit to it. Okay, so this is where we put a stop order to limit the losses. And, <clears throat> excuse me, so, um, Okay, now um, advanced order type simply means uh, combining all these orders together. So for example, if done order, what does it mean? If done order is usually used uh, with a limit order. So um, you put a queue limit order to buy at a certain price. If this order is done, you want to have a stop order or maybe a take profit order at the same time, okay? so. You can preset all this thing on screen, so you can put a stop order. Uh, you can put a limit order. I want to buy at this price. Say euro, maybe I want to buy, want to buy at 1.2, and then I want to put a stop order. If this 1.2 is done, buy for me. But if the market continues to move down to 1.1, sell for me. Okay, we can preset all this kind of instruction in the system. And then of course I'm going to take profit. I say okay, if you hit 1.3, you take profit for me. We can preset all this. Okay, so this is the what we call the if done order. Uh, trailing stop is um, usually used uh, as the name implied, right? Trailing, so it's following the market price. So let's say you put a stop order at this price. If the market moves in your favor, this trailing stop will adjust accordingly, move up accordingly. So if the market starts to turn, it will it will take profit for you at a higher price or cut loss for you at a higher price. So you don't lose or you don't, uh, you don't, the whole thing don't, uh, uh, you don't lose so much of it. Okay, so this is what we call trailing stop. And last one is a OCO order or one cancel order. This is usually used with a stop order or take profit. So once you have a position and you have a stop order to limit your loss and a take profit order, when either one of them is done, right? you want the other one to be cancelled because it's, you, it's, you're, you really have no position. So the other order is uh, redundant. So you want it to be cancelled automatically. So this is an OCO order. Um, once, the, let's say the take profit is done, automatically cancel my stop order. Okay, so this is OCO order. So all these order type are usually available for online trading. And uh, it's good to be familiarized with them so that when we execute the trade, right? Um, we know what kind of other types we want to use. Okay, so uh, that is for forex trading. Let me go to uh, stock indices. Okay, let me just quickly go to uh, stock index. 
So what is a stock index? A stock index is a compilation of, of stocks constructed in a manner right, to track the performance of a particular market or sector. So um, instead of individual shares, an index is a compilation of shares. Okay, using different methodology, they can come up with uh, pricing and to measure the performance of a particular market, let's say the US economy or the uh, US uh, industrial sector. Okay, so some example of uh, well known indices, it will be like the US S&P 500. Uh, traditionally, the US S&P 500 is more weighted towards the US financial sector. So there are many banks and insurance companies inside. Um, but nowadays, uh, there are some changes in the components and we see that it's actually more towards the technology as well. It's 50-50 um, with the financial and technology, all right? Um, but the next tech is uh, pure technology. Okay? It's, a, it's a heavily weighted on technology sector. So if the US technology companies are doing well, you will see that the NASDAQ index will be moving up. Okay. And Dow Jones also is a very uh, um, famous index. Uh, it measures the, it, it's more comprises of manufacturing companies in the US. Okay, so it's like, it's something like a measuring of the US manufacturing sector, All right? So um, these are some of the components. And for example, like there are some in the indices like the China A50, obviously from the name is a measurement of a China economy and it's more weighted toward the financial sector. And locally, we also have this uh, Singapore Stock Index. Uh, you can measure the Singapore uh, uh, economy and all the stocks performance based on the indices. So all these index, right, um, used to be a measurement, just like a guideline, like is, is US market doing well? So how do we know whether it's doing well? We look at the index and the index will tell us generally how is the market doing because it's a basket of shares. Right. So if it's green, you, you generally think that, oh, okay, the US market seems like it's doing okay, doing well. And um, so, um, all right, sorry, let me just go back. All right. So uh, other than this indices, right, of course, there are other index like the uh, German DAX, um, uh, this or Nikkei 225, these are Japanese index, these are all um, related to different countries and maybe different sectors. Okay, so um, this is what index is about. And right now, right, uh, there are many, many uh, tools that we can use to even trade the index itself. So last time we used to trade shares, only can trade shares, we can, we can buy or sell shares. But right now, there are many tools that we can use to even trade the index itself. Later, I will go on to share some of the advantages of trading index, right? So let's say I want to buy or sell the index. How do we do it? Um, in CFD, in, it's very simple. Okay, index is also traded on leverage. Okay, so that means it's also on margin trading. So in this example, I'm using the S&P 500. Okay, and you can see that the price quote on screen is 3411. 3411 and 3412 to buy. Okay. So let's say I want to buy. What's the notional value? The notional value is very simple. It's only it's one dollar per point. So the contract size is three four one two. I mean the the contract the price is three four one two. So the full value is three thousand four hundred and twelve. Okay, so it's one dollar per point. That's the notional value. So with margin trading means I don't have to come up with three thousand four hundred and twelve to buy this contract. Probably I need just ten percent. So maybe three hundred and forty I can buy this contract all right so in this example let's say um it's we are starting at 3350 okay so we're starting at 3350 so i think that it's going up so what i do is oh, i'll go buy so i skew a trade the notional value of the contract one per lot is 3350 us dollar but i don't have to come up with full amount i just need to pay a, a margin of 335 which is 10 percent okay so if in my account i have 335 dollars I can buy one lot of S&P, okay? So the leverage is 10 times. So for example, in this case, if let's say the market moves up after that, 1.5% uh, movement. So it's 3350, it moves up to 3,400. 
it moves up to 3,400. If I buy, right, if I bought at 3,350, I will have a profit of $50. Okay, with an investment of 335, $335, I made a profit of $50. Okay, and, but if I if I'm wrong and it drops 1.5% against me, I will also lose $50. Okay, so you can see the impact of leverage. The impact of leverage. So whatever profit or loss, right, is magnified. Okay, so in this case, if the leverage is 10 times, uh, then my profit or loss will be magnified by 10 times as well. Okay, so uh, we have to be very careful when we are using leverage. Um, if you have not done leverage trading or margin trading before, it's very important to understand the risk involved because there's a potential of losing more than whatever you have in your account. Okay, just imagine one SMP is only uh, uh, value is three thousand three hundred fifty, but you only need to pay three three five. So if the market moves, um, say thirty or forty percent, and then uh, your account has three hundred thirty five dollars, it's already more than uh, whatever you have in the account. Okay, so there's this risk that we need to understand when we are using leverage. But doesn't mean that it's no good or it's dangerous. Um, if we know how to use leverage to our advantage, right, uh, which I'll share later on some of the things, uh, it can be helpful to us in our investment portfolio. Okay. Yep. So it's a double-edged sword. Yeah, we better know what's going on. Okay. So um, some of the reason why people trade index instead of trading single stocks. Um, Trading a basket of stocks, right, help to cushion uh, companies that are not performing. So what does this mean? Basically, um, it's a diversification. So um, if let's say you have a view on the U.S. economy as a whole, okay, the U.S. economy as a whole or the China economy as a whole, you have a micro view of the whole economy and you want to express this view. So if you want to select a single stock, to represent the whole of us is maybe very difficult okay but if you want to select an index which is a basket of uh, shares then it's uh, easier because uh, you have more shares to represent the whole economy the whole us uh, market right so trading a basket of stocks help, help us to express our macro view okay of individual countries or individual sectors right and if you if you were to analyze the movement of uh, index right it does not swing as wildly as uh, individual stocks uh i don't know whether have you all been following what has been happening recently on uh, in us especially the game stock um i think if you see that the movement is uh, quite well okay in a few days in a few days it moved about 300 over times the shares actually increased by 300 over times. So um, that's really a lot of manipulation inside. Um, but in index, we don't usually see that kind of movement. Okay, we don't usually see that kind of movement. On an average a day, probably you will see a one to two percent kind of movement. So if you're looking at, um, uh, even with leverage, right? So one to two percent probably is about uh, 10 to 20%. So if you're looking for something that is not so wow, or you prefer something that is uh, uh, that doesn't give you a heart attack, right? Okay, so maybe index is something that you want to look at, right? And third point is uh, the analysis for index is a bit different from stock picking. For stock picking, you really need to do very in-depth analysis of the companies. So it could be very tedious. It could be very time-consuming, okay? But of course, if you'd like to do it, uh, uh, go ahead. Okay, there's no right or wrong, um, but what I'm sharing with you is, uh, if you, let's say you have a simple view, just think that China is going to uh, overtake US or uh, they're going to be very strong, okay? Then you have a view, you can just look at the Chinese index and this, just uh, buy the index itself to invest in the economy, okay? So you don't have to pick any company, just buy the index as a whole. All right, so these are some of the reasons why uh, people trade in the stock indices okay all right um let me just pause for a while uh is there any questions so far um 
I'm sorry, I just saw somebody say they, they can't hear me. Uh, is, is it okay? Can everybody hear me? Um, okay. Sorry. I assume everybody can hear me, yeah? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Apologize for that. I should have checked earlier on. Um, okay, so uh, let me continue. Okay, just put this away. Okay, so the next part is uh, why do so many people like to trade CFDs? Okay, uh, why is it so exciting and why is it uh, so appealing to, to people? Um, first of all, Trading CFD allows us to go long or short. Okay, if you have heard of the term, you probably understand what I mean. Long means you buy low and try to sell high. Okay, short means you are selling high and try to buy back at the low. Okay, why is this allowed in CFD? Because uh, there's no physical delivery. Okay, in shares, if we want to short short sell a shares, right? We need to borrow. Okay, we need to have the goods before we can sell. Okay, because it's deliverable. But in CFD, because there's no physical delivery involved, we are only trading the price. So actually, you can trade both directions. If you think it's going up, you can just buy. Okay, or go long. If you think it's coming down in the following market, then you can go short, and then you can uh, profit from the downside as well. Okay, so it's bi-directional. Um, and because of that, right, because we can short, a lot of uh, people use it to hedge. So, for example, if you are trading shares or you have an investment portfolio of shares and um, these are for long term, probably you're keeping it for dividends or you're keeping it for capital appreciation for long term. But due to some unexpected short term news or uncertainty, uh, the market just sell off. Okay, but you know that probably the fundamental of this stock is still strong. But because of general market sentiment, right? the stock is a sold down temporarily. So in this case, instead of just waiting for the price to rebound, if you want to protect yourself, right, what you can do is you can use the CFD to short sell. Okay, there are two ways you can do it. Either you sell the index that's related to your share or you do 100% hedge, you look for the counter that you're holding and then you short sell. But if you're holding a portfolio of shares that, in, that has many shares, uh, many counters, uh, then it may be difficult to do individual. So usually people do the index. Here they will just short the index. Uh, for example, if I'm holding Singapore shares, right, then I will short the Singapore index. If I'm holding US shares, then I will short either, depending on which uh, exchange I'm trading on, whether it's the Dow Jones, uh, NASDAQ, or S&P. Okay? So you use that to hedge. So if it comes down, of course, we, our stock, we may lose, uh, have some unrealized losses, but uh, if you are shorted on the index, the profit there may be able to cover some of the losses from the stock's holding. Okay, so this is uh, hedging. And um, leverage trading, yes. Why? Because we don't need a lot of capital to get started. Okay, like I shared some example just now. Um, you just probably, if you're trading Forex and you're just starting off and you want to try out a small contract, a micro contract, all you need is $50 to get started. Okay, just $50, you can trade, start to trade Forex. Of course, your profit loss may not be so big, but uh, if you're new to it and you just want to get a few and uh, try it out, um, instead of doing demo, which is sometimes uh, not so much meaning, you can really do some trading uh, with micro contracts to start off with minimum risk. Okay, so leverage is uh, very attractive, but I would like to emphasize again, uh, leverage is always a double-edged sword. So uh, please, uh, if you really um, want to use leverage trading, right, uh, we probably need to understand the risk. But later on, near to the end of the session, right, I'll actually share how we can manage risk using some strategies. Okay, I'll share with you on that later on. Okay, so leverage trading. And CFD, yes. Why people like to trade CFD? Because of low fees as well. So these are the traditional costs related to trading. 
uh, the spread means the difference between the buying and selling price because when you enter uh, a contract right uh, usually you need to buy at the ask price which is higher and then sell back at the uh, bid price okay so if the, if the market doesn't move and when you just buy or sell straight away there's a spread a difference okay that's the cost also and financing costs so if you're holding overnight positions there may be financing costs to um, uh, that that we need to pay or sometimes you may be receiving it depends on which side you are taking long or short okay so uh, these are the, the the traditional costs of course uh, some brokers they may charge commission if you're trading and uh, market data fee market data fee are fees incurred to look at the live price okay fees incurred to look at the live price so these are some of the costs related to trading but uh, over the years, right, you can see that um, commission and market data is out of the picture, okay? Because nowadays, if you trade CFD, most of the time it's zero commission, okay, zero commission. So it really, really becomes very low fee. It's very competitive and it's a very low fee and it's good news for all the traders, okay? So uh, basically, our cost is only the spread and the financing cost, all right? So we just need to know these two. So these are some of the reason why uh, people are trading on uh, CFD, a okay, bi-directional. So whether the market is up or down, you can trade both sides, opportunity for both sides. And you can use it to hedge your portfolio. Um, and because of leverage, right, when even if let's say you want to do hedging, you don't need to come up with the uh, full capital of whatever your portfolio value is. Okay. So, for example, if I'm holding a portfolio value of 100,000 and I want to hedge it, I don't need to come up with another 100,000 to hedge my portfolio. Okay, I only need to have a margin, probably 5 to 10% of this, and I can hedge my 100% of the portfolio. Okay, so that's the advantage of leverage trading as well. And zero commission. Okay, CFD, zero commission. So, uh, whatever you see on the screen, when you buy or sell, your profit or loss is net. Okay, you don't have to consider your commission. You say, oh, how much is my commission I have I traded? And um, so it's easy to calculate your profit and loss. Okay. Okay, so um, let me just quickly check if there any other questions. Okay. So uh, no questions. Okay, let me just uh, go to the next part. So what is margin trading? I'll just go very brief on this because I think uh, by, by the time right now, right, you should have a rough idea what is leverage trading and what it's about. But what I'm going to share here, right, is uh, what is a margin call? What is the process of a margin call? Let's say I'm doing margin trading and if I'm under margin, what happens? And how do I know whether I'm under margin or not? Okay, so this is what this part will be talking about. So again, in uh, Margin trading, what does it mean? It means that instead of coming up with the full contract value, I only need to pay a 5% to, well, maybe 30% or even 60% uh, if you are trading crypto, okay, of the full contract value. So because of this, I'm not paying full, right? Um, I need to maintain a minimum amount of uh, money in my account to honor my part, to honor my contract okay so this um this minimum amount is called the maintenance margin okay so let's let's take an example okay let's look at this example so um let's say i have a, a um, account balance of seven thousand dollars okay i have seven thousand dollars in my account the initial margin for gold that means if i want to trade gold i need to pay a deposit of five thousand dollars okay it's five thousand dollars and then the maintenance margin for gold is four thousand dollars. So if let's say uh, after I have a position, right? After I, I buy a one lot of gold, I need to maintain four thousand dollars at all times. Okay, that means my bad account balance of seven k, right? Cannot fall below four k. Okay, my account balance of seven k cannot fall below four k every time for each position that I have. All right. So for example, let's say I buy one lot of gold. Okay, and then I it somehow incurred an unrealized loss of $2,500. So in this case, do you think there's a margin call? 
Okay. So there will be no margin call because based on the above scenario, right? 7,000 minus 2,005, the unrealized, I mean, the balance is 4,005, which is still higher than the maintenance margin of 4,000. Okay. So there's no margin call in this case. So um, let's take a look at the second scenario. All right. So same, go. Initial margin 5,000, maintenance margin 4,000. I have an account balance of 7,000, and now my unrealized loss is 3,001. 3,100, sorry. Okay. So in this case, yes, I will get a margin call. Okay, why? Because 7,000 minus 3,100, my balance is 3,009, and it's below the maintenance margin of $4,000. So when will this margin call be issued? Um, margin call will be issued after the market close. That means using the closing price or the settlement price. Based on that, we will calculate whether this account is it in a margin call. Okay. So for example, in this case, if the closing price um, gives you an unrealized loss of three thousand one hundred, and then uh, it's below four thousand, right? So the next day there will be a margin call. Okay, next day there will be a margin call. And let's say there's a margin call. What are the options? What options do I have? Okay, the first option, of course, is to top out. That's the best because once you top out, the call is extinguished immediately. So you can start to trade freely again. So if I want to top up, how much do I need to top up? Okay, so now my balance is 3009. If I want to top up, I need to top up back to at least the initial margin, which is $5,000. Okay, so that means I need to top up at least $1,100. Then my account will be out of call. Okay, there will be no more margin call. All right, so that's the first option. The second option is I liquidate my position. Okay, I close my position, close some position to, to, to get out of the call. Yes, you can do that. So if you close everything, then of course, um, you won't have a... a um, um, okay, if let's say you choose, if let's say we choose to close the position, right, you, we will not be out of call until the market close. Okay, that means during the trading hours, right, we will still be uh, under margin call. That means we can't trade. We can't trade until market close. And then if the account balance is positive, then uh, not account balance, if the margin balance is positive, right, then we'll be out of call the next day. Okay. Similarly, if let's say I want to wait, I think the market is going to come back into my favor. Um, so in between, if let's say the market really goes back to our favor, but we are not out, we are not out of call yet. Okay. We'll only be out of call based on settlement price. So in between the day, right, if let's say the market goes positive, negative, positive, negative, uh, doesn't mean that you're in our call, in the call again, our call margin call again, no. It will only take one point, which is the market close or settlement price to, to judge whether, or to, to ascertain whether we, whether we still have a margin call or not. Okay. So if let's say market closes and uh, balance is positive now, then of course we are out of call the next day. Okay. So three options when we have a margin call. Okay. <clears throat> So, all right, um, um, next part, okay, next part will be more on the fundamental analysis. So what I'll do is I will start with FX first, uh, just a very simple sharing, because I believe uh, if you are in finance, econs, or uh, even business school, right, um, uh, your lecturer will probably be better at sharing fundamental, how to analyze the fundamental of the economy uh, better than me. Okay, So what I will be sharing is uh, how we categorize different currencies. So instead of telling you how to value a currency or how to value a shares, right? Uh, just based on a trader's point of view, uh, how we categorize currencies. So for example, first category of currency is a safe haven currencies. We probably have heard of this term before. So why are they called safe haven currency? Because usually if the stock market is bad, okay, or stock market is uh, tanking, coming down, these few currencies will go up. Okay, these few currencies will go up. 
So for the USD, it's very for obvious reasons. They are the world reserve currency. So um, if there's anything in the world that you want to hold, or you yeah, uh, not worry, right? Then probably it's the US dollar. But this is the tradition. Right now, there is actually a change in mindset. Just recent years, okay. Uh, I would say after the COVID, right? Uh, the US dollar fundamentals has changed. Okay. Um, there are still the world reserve currencies, but people are starting to lose confidence in the US dollar. Okay, because of the large amount of printing that they have been doing and how they spend the money, how they flood the flood the world with US dollars, right? There's this uh, concern coming in. So people are looking for alternative reserve currencies. And one of the thing that people look at right now, of course, is the Bitcoin. If you, if you, if you, if you see how has the Bitcoin uh, uh, rally so far, right? It's, it's really crazy. Uh, I, I don't know. If you ask me how far is it going to go, I, I really don't know because it's, it's something that's never happened before. Uh, but you can, from here, right, we can see that the US dollar is, uh, investors are starting to lose a bit of confidence in the US dollar. That's why they are trying to ship their money into other assets. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, just a bit of sharing on the US dollar. But for the, and the Japanese yen, why is it a safe haven currency? It's not exactly safe heaven um, as in it's not because Japan is a very uh, uh, strong economy or what but because of the reaction that the currency has in when in times of uh, uh, when the stock market is uh, dropping why because Japan has been funding the world Japan has been in a low interest rate environment for the longest time okay I would think probably 30, 30 years down the road it have been zero, almost zero interest rate, low interest rate, okay, for for very very long, and that's why a lot of countries or a lot of uh, investors are borrowing money from Japanese, from the Japanese bank, okay, so they borrow a lot of money, uh, because they're cheap to borrow, and then they use this money to invest elsewhere in the world, where they can get higher returns, okay, so, so imagine, let's say right now I borrow Japanese yen. And I go to the US and buy the US stock market. Okay, that gives me better returns than the interest I have to pay. So now the market is going up nicely. Okay, good. But what if one day suddenly the market starts to tank, starts to come down, and I start to sell off all my uh, assets in the US? Okay, because uh, maybe a, a recession is coming. Okay, I start to take profit, I sell off. And after you sell off, you're holding US dollar, right? Because you borrow in Japanese yen, you go to US invest, you need to convert to USD and then you can invest in US. So when you sell all your assets, you hold the US dollar, you still remember that you need to pay back in Japanese yen, right? So what usually people do is they need to hedge into the Japanese yen. They, either they completely back to Japanese yen or they uh, do a forex trade using margin to hedge the US against Japanese yen. Of course, they still need to pay back in Japanese yen, right? So there's an exchange rate risk there. So they will hedge. So that's why when um, they sell off as in assets in uh, uh, in other parts of the world, right? You will see the Japanese currency is going up. It's not because exactly they are very strong, but because of the nature of the 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 financing that they have been doing. So everybody want to hedge the Japanese yen. Okay. Having said that, uh, recently you will see that the euro is also becoming a funding currency. That's why sometimes, although not so clear yet, but sometimes you see that when the market is dropping, right, you also see euro uh, strengthening a bit. Okay, so these are some of the relation to um, the market. So this is why they are called a safe haven currency. Okay, Swiss franc has been um, very, uh, uh, it's like Singapore, they have very good name. Okay, and uh, one of the healthiest country in Europe with low debts and low employment. So uh, people don't mind keeping money in Swiss franc. Okay, so this is uh, one of the first category, safe haven currency. So moving on, we have a commodities currency. So um, like Australian dollars, they are very uh, rich in natural minerals, raw materials, coal, iron ore and such thing. So during the Chinese, uh, the China boom, uh, 
oh, they were one of the beneficiary of this uh, bull market. Uh, right? So you can see that um, the, when there's demand for all these materials, right, uh, Australian dollar will strengthen because you need Australian dollars to buy their resources. Okay. So same thing, New Zealand is also export uh, commodity uh, currency, more on the agriculture side. And then Canadian is uh, oil, okay? Exports a lot of oil to the US. And so if generally, if the global economy is good, right? This, you can, we can expect this currency to grow because if the economy is growing, there will be demand for all these raw materials. Okay, so they are called like commodities currencies. And of course, uh, not forgetting the Euro and the British Pound. So Euro is the second largest reserve currency of the world. And um, EU, uh, the, the whole EU is the largest exporter to the world. Okay, you may think that, oh, isn't China the largest exporter? Yes, China as a country, they are the largest exporter. But EU as a region, right, as a zone, right, of course, they are larger than China. They are bigger than China. Okay, so uh, because the whole of uh, a European Union, they are using Euro, so uh, they, you can say that they, they represent the export sentiment. Okay, globally export sentiment. So of course, same thing, if the economy is good, you will see Euro should be strengthening because there'll be more demand for their products. Okay, and talking about Pound, uh, Pound has a very long history, of course, we know UK, uh, England has been very strong uh, previously in history. Um, so their currency is uh, one of the strongest. And um, in UK, right, uh, their service sector represents a big amount of their GDP. So uh, when there's demand for pound, you can say that probably it represents a service sector sentiment. The same thing, these are all respond currency means that if let's say everybody is bullish, this currency should be up. Okay, so these are how we categorize uh, different currencies uh, into the different categories so that we can understand their relation with the stock market or with uh, the, the market as a whole, how it works. All right. Okay, so uh, some other factors that will affect forex rates, right? It's very simple. Uh, I'm sure this probably you have uh, studied this in your uh, class as well. So central bank lending rates or um, interest rate okay, environment. So um, if the central bank increase or hike rates, right, then uh, usually the currency should increase because right now if you deposit your money in the bank in the country, right, you probably get more interest return. Okay, so if a bank increases the interest rate, the likelihood that the currency will increase, it will strengthen. Okay. And vice versa, if it cuts rate, then of course uh, uh, we are expecting the price to drop. Okay. And inflation rates. Okay. Inflation rates usually will influence how the central bankers think. Because if inflation rate is too high, then um, central bank uh, has the pressure to hike rates, to increase the rate, to strengthen the currency, to bring down the inflation rate, or to cool the cool the buying power. Okay, internal, uh, sorry, buying power, the lending lending um, rates are, so that uh, people don't lend too much and overspend. Okay, so um, inflation rates will affect central bank decision and that will return in return also affect the forex price. Of course, political stability. So if a country is stable, country is, uh, uh, um, there's no, no trouble, right? And of course, the, the currency will be strong. And foreign investment, because if there's a lot of investment coming into a country, uh, they will need to buy your currency, they will need to change their currency so that they can invest directly into your country. So foreign investment, if the country is able to attract a lot of uh, overseas investors, right, then the currency will also strengthen. Okay, supply and demand. Okay, I have about five minutes left. So the last part, right, I would like to share with you, um, instead of um, trading uh, um, directional, that means um, I think that, okay, this, uh, I have a view that 
the COVID situation coming, right? And maybe it's going to drop. Market is going to be bad. So instead of um, just buying or selling, there are other ways to trade the market. Okay, so let me uh, introduce to you. I don't know whether have you all heard of this spread trading. Okay, what exactly is spread trading? Okay, spread trading. Some of you probably have heard of it. Spread trading is actually buying of one asset and shorting the other or selling another related asset. And how do we profit? Is when the price of the assets, right, that we buy or sell start to diverge or converge. So if it moves away, if the price moves away, we will profit. Okay, of course, if your direction is correct, if you if you think that it's going to open, it's going to diverge, then uh, we will profit. If we think that it's going to converge and we execute the trade, then we can also profit. Okay, so let me just give you a quick example. What do I mean by that? I'll use uh, uh, Dow Jones and Nasdaq as an example. Okay, so for example, Dow Jones is uh, heavily weighted towards the industry sector. Okay, it's heavily weighted towards the industry sector. And um, during the, uh, sorry, Nasdaq is more weighted towards the technology sector. So during the COVID crisis, right, um, of, of course, right now on high side, we know, okay, that uh, manufacturing is going to be affected, okay, and technology uh, is being used more, it's being used more uh, during this period of time. Um, to to um because more people work from home so we need more technology so with that in view right um you can see that there's an opportunity so for example in december 2020 this is where the uh, sorry 2019 this is where the first covid cases uh, in wuhan was uh, found okay and you can see that when the news first came out right actually Dow Jones didn't drop, okay? You look at, this is the December, the blue line is where the first COVID started, okay? It didn't drop, okay? Actually continued to move up at least another 4% before in February it starts to crash. Okay, just remember, if you are using leverage and it's 10 times, right? 4% is about 40%. So if, if we think that, oh, with the COVID, I think the market should come down because it's very serious, the lockdown is happening. Okay, I will short the market. But if we short the market and we try to time the market, right, it may be very difficult because instead of coming down immediately, right, it actually moves another two months before it crash, crashes. So if we don't have the capital or we don't have the buffer, right, to hold for two months, probably we will lose, lose on the way. And then by the time it crashes, we don't have a position. So instead of doing directional, what we can do is, okay, you can see the Nasdaq, okay? So if we have a view, we say that, okay, if the COVID case comes in, uh, manufacturing is going to be affected for sure, okay? And um, technology is going to be better. So I'm favor, I'm more uh, in favor of the Nasdaq uh, getting, uh, that means performing, outperforming the Dow Jones. Okay, so what I do is I'll buy the Nasdaq and short the Dow Jones. They buy the Nasdaq and short the Dow Jones. So if I do that, um, even during the initial uh, news release where the COVID was uh, started, right? When the market is up, just now we saw Dow Jones increased by 4.12%, okay? And the Nasdaq gained 12.3%. So if I long the Nasdaq and short the Dow Jones, right? Net, I make about 8%, okay? From December to February period, I make about net 8%. And after that February, Dow Jones crash dropped 38%. Okay, this is our Dow Jones, dropped 38%. How about the Nasdaq? Nasdaq also dropped, but it only dropped 32%. So if we short the Dow Jones and we long the Nasdaq, net, we make a 6%. Okay, net, we make 6%. And then after that, of course, we know there's a recovery, a strong recovery. Dow Jones recovered 73%. Nasdaq, okay, 107%. So if you're long the Nasdaq and short the Dow Jones, um, net, we make about 30 over percent. Okay, so this is spread trading. 
regardless of the direction, right, if I, my fundamental analysis is correct, that the different sector will diverge, and then I do my trades, right? I buy the NASDAQ, I sell the Dow Jones, I can still make a profit. So I don't have to time the market. I don't have to know when is it coming down. Of course, if you're very good at timing the market, you will definitely make more. Okay, because if you see that the drop is 38%, if you short all the way, you can short all the way, you make 38%. But honestly, when we're executing a trade, how many times can we time it correctly? Okay, so if, let's say you're going for a strategy that is more stable, that you want more stability, and um, another way of uh, viewing the market, right? You can try spread trading. Okay, so the advantages of spread trading, right? We don't need to pick top or bottom. Okay, you don't need to pick top or bottom. You just need to know that this, you just need to analyze and say that, okay, these two sectors or these two countries, they will be diverging or converging. Then you make the buy or sell trade. And there's lower profit and loss swing. Okay, you don't see big swing up or down your profit and loss. Okay, it's easier to manage your risk. And it's non-directional dependent. Okay, whether up or down, as long as the market, as long as the two contracts or two market move uh, widen, I make. Okay, so don't need to time the market. Lesser risk, okay, you can control risk. Of course, lesser risk probably means lesser profit as well. But a probability of getting it correct is easier, it's higher. Okay, because you don't have to depend on direction. Okay, let me just quickly uh, give you an example, a live example. Um, okay, let me just share my chart. Uh, Okay, uh, do you all see this chart here? Okay, so I want to take an example. This is uh, China A50. Okay, this is the China A50. So it represents the China economy. And then we have the, I will show you this is the, okay, I will take the German index. Okay, so this is the German index. So why am I comparing these two index? Like I mentioned, right, German uh, is uh, third, okay, German itself, a country, is the third largest ex, uh, exporter. China is the largest, okay? So these two uh, represent the exporting countries. And right now we see that China, China market uh, is actually doing very well. Why? Because the, of the situation in Europe, the COVID situation in Europe, right, is still very bad. So there's a lot of manufacturing uh, or uh, factories are still closed. Okay, so China is reaping this benefit because they have locked down. They already settled most of their COVID problem. They are able to start their manufacturing earlier. So when you have lesser competition from Europe, right? You have people place more order with you. Definitely, you will have a better uh, 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 returns. So you can see this is the China A50. It's going up. Okay, but at this price, do you dare to buy? Honestly, I may not dare to buy because it's really near the record high. Okay, and if you see the German is consolidating, it's not really moving up. Okay, so in this scenario, if we think that the Chinese uh, economy is still going to be better than the German economy, very simple, we just buy the, the China index and short the German index. This is the spread trading. Okay, so this is just one example. Um, please do your own analysis. I'm just giving you this example uh, um, from, from what I see. Okay, and um, if it comes out right, right, then we will see that the China economy will continue to boom. And maybe the German index will just be range trading and then we can make the profit. Okay, once, the, once we see more divergence, then we can see make a profit. So this is an example of spread trading. Okay, uh, I think I would have to quickly finish up. Okay, let me go back to the slides. Actually, that is the end of my slide. So what I will do now is I'll just put this on here. Um, I'd like to uh, let everybody know that we have this uh, tertiary trading challenge. 
uh, it starts in a month's time, 15 March. So right now you can actually register for it. So you just scan this QR code, look at the information and register for it. Okay, there are attractive prizes to be won. So uh, you can actually sign up now. All right, so take the time to just uh, scan this QR code. Meanwhile, let me check if there's any questions. Okay. So, I uh, hope everybody has scanned already. And next, uh, after this webinar, we have a series of other webinars upcoming. So, the next one will be on 22nd February. Uh, it's trading strategy with chart patterns. So, if you are interested in technical analysis, you can actually sign up and then uh, uh, join this webinar to learn more about technical analysis. Okay, same thing, you can scan this QR code for more information and register for the session. Okay, so um, actually with that, uh, it comes to the end of my session here. So I hope everybody uh, gains something. Of course, uh, it's a very short time that we have. I won't be able to cover everything. If you have more questions or if you have anything else that you want to find out, please uh, do contact us. Uh, my, colleagues, my, my colleagues will be contacting you to follow up with you on the session. And if you have any questions, just feel free to um check on check with them okay and then uh, we can we'll get back to you on that okay so uh, thank you everyone for your attention and then i hope that you have a good evening and happy new year to you thank you very much <laughs>